All right, everyone, welcome to part two of our celebration of magic here at the Oracular School of Astrology. It is my esteemed pleasure to introduce you to Mr. Dylan Warren Davis, who will be presenting on the topic of the cosmology of the hand. Okay, um, I would just like to thank Michael for giving me this opportunity to present one of my pet topics, Caramancy. Um, I mean, the word chiromancy means divination through the hand, so it's very fitting that Michael has included it in today's uh, set of presentations. Um, I've been reading hands now for, oh gosh, better part of 40 years, and I can't think how many thousands of people's hands I've read in that time. Um, it is a, a fascinating topic, and it's a topic that's actually got me out of tight corners in my life, where I've had absolutely no money whatsoever, and uh, in desperation, um, I mentioned I was a hand reader, and oh, can you read my hand? And uh, immediately, I can earn some money, and uh, that's, that's got me out of quite a few tight corners over the years. Fortunately, that's not a problem these days. But um, it's a very useful tool to have, very portable skill, and it has quite literally taken me around the world. Um, and that in itself has created a potential opportunity for reading hands for people in different cultures and things. Okay, so this is an introductory talk. Um, there'll be a few topics that people want to go further on, but being introductory, I can only sort of skirt over them. Um, it is leading to a qualifying chiromantical course that uh, I'm doing here with the Raculos, which will be kicking off next year, next May, I believe, sometime. So were you to participate in that, then we will go through everything in far more detail. Right, so let's start off. Um, hand reading or chiromancy is closely linked to the teaching of Semeticism, as, as Michael has been pointing out. And one of the best ways of showing this link is this illustration from Robert Flood's History of the Microcosm. If you look at the, the image, we've got man in the middle here, standing between a realm of light above his head and on the back of an egg. So mankind is depicted between heaven and earth, if you like, his animal existence and his spiritual nature. And if you look within the sort of pie chart of the ring here, you can see various disciplines. On the left, obviously, is chiromancy, as we've been talking about it, which is closely related to physiognomy. And physiognomy is the, the study of the structure of the head in particular, as well as the overall shape of the body. Then at the bottom, you can see the name Genethliologia, which is a rather convoluted ancient word for natal astrology. So you can see these two disciplines are connected. Um, Michael has just briefly touched on sort of memory and mnemonics. And here you can see the art of memory as the next one round. Um, then we have geomancy, and geomancy is a bit different from what most people have in mind when they think about geomancy, think about ley lines and dowsing and so forth. But as a divination, um, it involves having two stones, and you draw a circle in the ground, and you stand some distance away from the circle, and then you lob the stone towards the circle. So the stone will either fall inside the circle or it will miss it. 
and you have a go with the second stone and again it will become inside the circle or a miss it. Um, so you get various possibilities, two misses, two hits or one in, one out. And by means of this, if you look at the shape of the sort of shield, it takes you to signs of the zodiac, to planets, to the elements on Earth, and it's quite an extraordinary form of divination, but it's largely forgotten from sort of medieval times. I don't know anyone who's doing it these days. Then you see prophecy, um, and that's sort of, we would think more in terms of uh, clairvoyance these days. And then the final one I haven't explained is the science of the pyramids. And you can see from the diagrammatic representation there, a sort of depiction of the light above coming down to earth below and the sort of earth being reflected in the heavens. So it's as above, so below the famous hermetic statement. So within the circle, you see Caramancy along with all the other divinatory arts. And Robert Flood here saw each of these divinatory uh, disciplines as having the potential of revealing man's inner nature. And this is subtly concealed by the whole diagram being based upon the shape of the solar glyph. So you can see the circle the circumference of the circle with all the names of disciplines and then in the middle you've got the dot of the animal and that is the seed of potential the source of light within that ultimately is unfolded um, before we can connect to our spiritual or divine natures Another medieval image we will look at. This is a lovely depiction of Sodia Kuman from Duke de Berry's Trairie Sher or Book of Hours. And you see the signs of the zodiac from head to toe. And from our point of view, Gemini, you can see the two twins hiding behind each shoulder here, connected with the arms and the hands. And the zodiacal sign is ruled by Mercury. And Mercury is synonymous with the vital force. And when it comes to the hand, is synonymous with the flow of energy through the lines of the palm. Coming back to this sort of divinatory idea, um, throughout the ages, hand reading has excited the wrath of the church that people involved with hand reading um, have always quoted this bit from Job in the Old Testament that God has placed signs in the hands of all the sons of men that all the sons of men may know his work well that's in the essence in the sense of what the divination of through the hand is all about So we've got a symbolic link between Mercury and Hermes, Greek equivalent to Mercury, and also Hermes Trismegistus, who is the sort of teacher behind the sort of Corpus Hermeticum. So we're going to explore more of that na nature later. But first up, I'm going to look at some of the basic principles of hand reading. And the first one to consider is the form and the structure of the hand. Indeed, the whole body is an expression of the psyche that resides within. So everything you can see about the hand has significance. And the role of the person reading the hand is to interpret these features and explain what they all mean in the sort of perspective within the framework of that person's life and experiences. 
This is an illustration that kind of brings the point home. You can use the eye. When we look at everything uh, with our eyes, there's the external form that we observe and optically we get an inverted image of everything that we look at. So when we look at the hand, we are simultaneously experiencing a second image on the back of the eye, which amazingly, big mystery of our neurological system is interpreted as our experience of vision. Now, the important point here is these two images, the image that you see and the image on the back of the eye are intimately connected. So by describing everything outside, even though you can't see this image on the back of the eye, you can describe what is there. So in a similar way, you're looking at um, the form and structure of the hand, but you can't directly see the psyche, the immaterial psyche, the invisible part of that person. Yet by understanding this simple um, direct relationship between the two, by describing the external form, you're in parallel describing the inner psyche of that person. So we've mentioned um, the link between chiromancy and the hermetic tradition. And if we use another one of Robert Flood's wonderful illustrations, here we've got the three worlds. And it starts basically with the realm of light, so deus at the top there. And then from this realm of light, you can see the spiral coming down. First up, you've got men's, the universal mind or universal consciousness. And then you've got the angelic realm with the names of the angels, archangels, thrones, principalities. Within the angels, you've got Calum Stellatum, the stars in the heavens, all the signs of the zodiac. And descending from within um, Calum Stellatum, you've got the Latin names of the elements, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Sun, uh, Mercury, um, oh, sorry, Venus, Mercury, Moon. And then at the Earth level, we've got the uh, elemental world, of fire, air, water, and earth. So the whole world of creation as visualized within Hermetic teachings, um, thinks of God breathing, willing this whole world into creation. So in the Lord's Prayer, um, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. So you've got God willing it into creation, the whole world. And so the correct path of action is understanding that will so that you lead your life in accordance with the cosmos. Now applying that knowledge to the hand, the three worlds, uh, the intellectual world of the angels and archangels um, connected to the fingers. Then you've got the celestial world connected with the planets. That's to do with the summation of all the lines on the palm of the hand. And then you've got the elemental world, uh, which is connected with our physical existence, that's connected to the palm and it's connected to the overall structure of the hand, um, skin texture and so forth. So that sort of puts it together. Um, in a more human context, I sometimes give the analogy, the shape of the hand is like the vehicle that you're born into. So every vehicle has its strong points and its weak points. 
So for just purely illustration's sake, you're born with a boat as your body. You don't want to drive it down the road. You won't get very far. It's obviously adapted to being in the water. So that's the best environment for it to be within. Similarly, if you have a car, don't try and sail it across the ocean. Um, it's, it's a bit flippant, but it's a very simple but profound analogy um, because we have an element that uh, sort of rules the hand shape. And if people lead their lives in accordance with that element, generally their lives are harmonious and productive. But if they don't lead their lives in accordance with the element, they'll be literally a fish out of water and they can't breathe. Um, life is, is problematic. So if the shape of the hand is like the vehicle you're born into, then the lines of the hand is descriptive of you traveling through journey on your life. So it's how you're steering your vehicle, where you've come from, where you're currently at, where you're progressing towards. Um, so you've got a whole lifetime in a sense mapped out in the course of the lines. And then with the fingers, um, the intellectual world, that's descriptive of the knowledge that you can draw from with which to make sense of the world and to make informed choices about the direction you're steering your vehicle. So you can either totally ignore your higher nature, your spiritual wisdom, and just bash on regardless and doubtless life will throw all sorts of obstacles in your way. Or you can invite and incorporate that into your life and be enormously enriched and ennobled by it. So to do this job, um, the job of the hand reading is to look at the form and structure of the hand and then communicate what you see in terms of that person uh, making sense of. And to do that, you need symbolism. And it forms a bridge between the outer form of the hand and the inner psyche. And it conjures up the ideas that evoke the words that you need to express and communicate to that person. And you know, as you go through symbols, every time you go over them, they're different. You will find new ideas associated with it. Particularly when you've got someone's hand there, um, you're tuning into them, and consequently, you will see ideas specific pertaining to that person. So it's important that you go with what's evoked with your imagination in your mind's eye, rather than just merely trying to remember what you learned from some textbook somewhere. So we've got three sets of symbols, and this sort of concords with what Michael was talking about in his divinatory um, lecture. Um, we've got the elemental symbols, which are part of the physical world. We've got the planetary symbols, and we've got the zodiacal symbols. So when we study hand reading, we have to look at all these symbols in depth. Um, but today I'm just going to skirt over them as I say. But I'm going to use this illustration because I think this is a, a very simple um, illustration that immediately connects people to what the elements are all about. So the term elements, so they're common to many cultures since antiquity, the name element was coined by Plato. And he described the elements, earth, water, fire and air, as the universal forces upon which life depends. So if you imagine taking any of those elements away, life cannot flourish. So earth, 
is the planet, our terra firma beneath our feet. Water irrigates the soil. It's the universal solvent for which all biochemical processes take place in. Air is the atmosphere that we breathe. And in fire is the light of the sun, which provides us with heat, light, energy, and effectively enables things to flourish on this planet. Ether is a sort of transcendent element. It represents the vital force. It's present in the physical world, but it's also, you can't see it, you can't perceive it. And yet it's behind the process of manifestation of the four elements. Plato uses the term being and becoming. So ether relates to that world of being. So if you imagine sitting in deep meditation or becoming absorbed into some sort of creative pastime or absorbed in prayer and whatever you personally do, um, or maybe it's just connecting with nature and going for a long walk so you can just empty your head full of ideas and just simply be, feel connected once more with nature. When you get to that point, you start to feel alive again. That is what ether is all about. So in that stillness, you find there's a light, you find there's a clarity, you become energized. Thoughts may come up, but with every thought, suddenly the four elements start to become manifest, become created. Um, so that is to do with the world of becoming. Once you start thinking, you connect with your body and the world around you. Um, so that I think is a very useful description of being and becoming. So since life depends upon the elements, what more powerful symbols do we have for describing life itself? Uh, I can't think of anything better. So one of the ways that we um, apply the elements is the overall shape of the hand, which as I just said, is like the vehicle that you're born into. So these are the archetypal shapes and it's all based upon firstly, whether the palm is square or whether it's oblong. And then secondarily to the palm, whether the fingers are long or whether they're short. So you can make a very simple distinction between the palm being to do with your physicality and then your fingers is to do with your psychology or your mental experience. So in a sense, when the hand grows from in, in the embryo, you get the palm forming and then gradually little bumps appear and cartilaginous stumps gradually grow and then the fingers come out. So that's why you consider the palm first and then the fingers secondarily to it. So earth and air have the square palms and fire and water have the oblong palms. So let's look at them individually. The earth hand is a square palm with fingers shorter than the palm length. And just from that observation, you can see here is someone who is in a sense very grounded in their body and through their body they're very connected to mother nature around them. So this sort of shaped hand you seldom see in experience of, of reading western hands as it basically describes features that are found much more in indigenous cultures like the aborigines in, in Australia um, just as one example. 
So there's very little sort of mental development in the way that we in the West would think about education and, and writing of ideas, reading your books and so forth. But they have an immense knowledge of nature, a very kind of practical, empirical knowledge. Um, they will understand things in nature that most Westerners will have difficulty understanding. So they tune in readily to the rhythms of nature and you find within their various cultures, their nature is worshipped and obviously the changing of the seasons and the solstitial points and the equinoctial points are all part of um, various celebrations and so forth. Now to contrast that, look at the air hand. If earth is, is compact and constricted, then air is expansive and you've got a large hand here. And correspondingly, the fingers are long. So with that, you can see a far more psychological expression of the, the air element there. So the air type person dwells within their mind. They delight in all forms of ideas, languages, communication. That's their whole sort of milieu. And they'll be bored just sitting in connection with nature. Um, the fire hand has an oblong palm, but what's notable here is that the fingers are shorter than the palm length. So you get a sort of extended physicality. Um, people kind of train their body more like an athlete. Um, their experience of life is on a daily surge of energy that wells up within them, propelling them into action. So they like challenges. Um, they like often conflict um, that provokes them into action. Um, they like creative expression where they feel there's a purpose, a direction to what they're doing in life. But this energy creates a restlessness within them, which means that it's difficult for them to sit down and be patient, study things. So as soon as they get an idea, they want to do it. Um, they don't necessarily think about what is the best idea and what consequently is the best way of doing it. They'll just go ahead and, and do it. And then the final hand shape in this little collection is the water-shaped hand. And here is oblong again, like the fire hand but we've got long, thin fingers. And you can see there's a slenderness. So with that slenderness, you've not got the groundedness in physicality of the palm that we see in the earth hand. And similarly, you haven't got the expansiveness of ideas that you get with the air hand. So the water hand effectively is, is sort of in limbo between the thinking, the logical mind, and the physical body. So they dwell within the realm of feelings and emotions, and have delight in expressing themselves through art, music, and color, which they find enormously evocative. So when you take your hand shape, you can take these patterns that I outlined and superimpose them onto the palm. So this gold line here, that's the silhouette of the earth shaped hand. And you can see the fingers are too long for that. So you have to exclude earth. Again, if we take the template for the water shaped hand, it's simply not slender enough to be a water-shaped hand. You've got a square palm and so forth. So you have to exclude that one. Here we've got the template for the fire-shaped hand. 
and you can see the fingers are too long for that. So by sort of deduction, you end up with an air-shaped hand and you can see the air-shaped hand has got the squareness of the palm and the length of the finger to be classified with that air element. So here's your archetypal uh, air hand. And from what I recall about this person, he was involved with publishing and um, he commissioned authors. Uh, he was involved with going through all the texts, correcting them and so forth. And so that was what he did in his life, which was in accordance with the air element. Um, If he was, say, probably in a realm of, of sort of dream imagination, he'd find that much, much more difficult. You've got quite a rational person here. Um, okay, so elements can be applied to the hand in a number of ways. We've got skin texture, we divide the hand into four sections, the quadrants. But I'm not going to go into those here. I want to move on to the lines. So what are lines and why are they given planetary names? Dylan? Yes? Someone had a question and the question was, which hand would you look at? Would you look at the right hand or the left hand? Right. Okay, well, there's a polarity between the hands and that uh, your active hand, which for 9% of people is their right hand, you will consciously direct more energy into it. Consequently, its features and formations reflect that person more in the present. Conversely, the passive hand will have had less energy going into it so its features and formations reflect more of the past. So you have a polarity between the hands so that when you read a hand, you largely focus on the active hand. But as you're reading the active hand, you need to constantly refer to the passive hand. Um, because if you've got someone who, say, has particular um, emotional problems that may have come from their family background, then the passive hand will have far more information of the parental experience that they had growing up, which will have come changed by our experiences as we go through life. So often when resolving various difficulties, various issues, they're not in your kind of immediate present that something's gone wrong. It's something that's buried long ago, in which case looking at the passive hand um, is the most uh, informative of what you need in order to kind of draw that knowledge into that person's awareness. Okay, so let's return to the lines. Now, a lot of people think of lines as folds in the skin. And part of this is anatomy textbooks often refer to these as palmar creases. And that is totally untrue. Um, the idea being that if, if you make a sort of movement with the skin, like scoring a piece of paper and you can then bend at that point, um, that's their explanation. But if you look at your fingers, many of you will have longitudinal uh, lines on various phalanges. In order to create those lines from folding, then the flesh on your phalanges would actually have to concertina up from the side. And even when you pinch it, it's actually very difficult to get the uh, flesh on the phalanx to fold up longitudinally. So you have to 
ignore that idea. So the explanation that palmistry um, hand reading has had for centuries that there are flows of vital force and as such their patterns and formations uniquely express what is happening in the psyche and the consciousness of that person. Now when I first started hand reading I came across this wonderful guy called Harry Oldfield who was into Kerlin photography and he and I collaborated together and when we were collaborating, he came up with this amazing image of the energy present in a palm. Now, I can't spend any time explaining girl in photography, but basically it, it's a sort of electrical means of amplifying the energy field around the body, whereby it gives off light and that can be recorded on photographic film. We were inspired by a lady called Dr. Thelma Moss, who worked at uh, UCLA in the 70s. And she sort of picked, came out of Russia at that time. And she was intrigued by healers and she wanted to see what effect um, the healing process had on the hand. And what she did was to take the index finger and put it on the camera and then turn on the electrical field to make this image. So this is the fingertip at rest, if you like, of the healer not healing. In the second instant, they were told to switch on the healing energy. So as the healing energy was directed through the fingers into the hand, you can see a whole region kind of lit up. Now that spawned a whole series of studies and things of relationships and how the energy kind of worked did the energy blend or did it become dissonant and spiky? Um, just for now though, it gives you an insight into how every time we think about things, how we change our attitudes, as we communicate with various people, as we go through various experiences and become involved with various relationships, all these things are constantly changing our energy and that is then reflected through all of the patterns and formations of the line, all the lines apart. Interestingly, um, the lines change. Now, a lot of people don't realise that, but for me it's, it's the most inspiring part of hand reading. And lines can change within six weeks. Now, six weeks is the physiological time for the skin to grow from a bottom germinal layer where the skin cells are all dividing and they progress up and they slowly die off and to the surface of the skin, your skin cells are dead. And every time we just make that movement, thousands of dead skin cells flag off and we have this astonishing uh, detail that 80% of our household dust is in fact dead skin cells. Anyway, the physiological growing of skin takes six weeks. So if people go through some sort of dramatic experience and it has an impact on them, but lasts longer than six weeks, then the lines will change in their pattern and expression. And this link between consciousness and the lines in the hand is most readily shown in a coma. Obviously, in a coma, people go into a vegetative state and their consciousness is withdrawn from the body. And corresponding to that, 
the lines disappearing on the hand are actually a clinical sign of someone being in a coma. And then for the fortunate ones who wake up again from whatever has precipitated their coma, then the lines will start to reassert their presence back on the hand. We've got flows of vital energy and uh, unique formations. No two hands, even left and right, are identical. And the diversity amongst the human population is astronomical. Um, so how do we interpret all this? Well, traditionally, um, if you think of the vital force flowing through them, we can use elements as one set of tools to describe what's happening. And we can use the planets. Um, certain regions of the palm are known as mounts. And these are usually at the base of the fingers or the base of the thumb here. And I believe People who kind of been involved with astrology, they've made this correlation of certain planet being strong in the natal chart, and they've then found correspondingly that part of the hand is more pronounced on that particular person. And I believe that's how through eons of time that we've got the like Saturn Mount, the Jupiter Mount, Sun Mount, Mercury Mount, Venus Mount, Luna Mount, and so forth. So if you think of the line as like a river, and then the mounts are being connected to the planets, then when any line either touches a mount, flows through it, uh, starts on a mount, then the energy, the planetary energy of that mount is sort of injected into the flow of that line. And so by means of that, there's a correlation um, between a particular line, a particular planet, and everything that that planet represents. So just to illustrate that, well, before I get there, this is the glyph for Mercury, which I'm sure you recognize. Um, I set it out in a table here. Mercury is unique in having this tripartite um, symbolism of the crescent of the spirit, the circle of the soul, and the cross of matter. So the vital force, or Mercury, embodies everything in the realm of ideas, medium of emotionality, and it's to do with the vitality of the sustains our body. So you can see it's connected to the three worlds, spirit, soul, and matter, mind, heart, and body, ideas, emotions, sensations. So all the different planetary qualities are kind of embodied in Mercury. If we start with Venus, here is the Venus mount at the base of the thumb, and the Venus line is the one that curves around the base. So if you think about Venus traditionally ruling the mother, and particularly the womb, then it's through an act of love between our parents that we acquire, the soul acquires a body, through our mothers and is born into the physical world. So the energy that flows through this line is the energy that is to do with supporting and sustaining our physical body. And that's reflected in the palmistic name of lifeline or the vitality line. If we haven't got a body, then effectively we can't experience life upon this planet. So that's how we go about ascribing the planets to particular lines. So in the angle of the thumb, we've got the, the headline here going across to the lunar side of the hand. 
little finger side. Mercury is connected with the mind. And it's obviously this line is to do with thoughts, ideas, our ability to think, to evaluate ourselves, our ability to communicate, um, and so forth. Dylan? Yep. Uh, someone else had another question, and the question was, from where do you measure the length of the palm to compare it to the fingers? Um, the base of the palm here mm -hmm. to where the lines interbound your creases at the base of the fingers are. So that's your length of the palm, not your width of the palm. Okay. And, and then you take that length and you can then compare it to the length of the palm. One final question is, what if you have birthmarks on the palm that intersects with the line? So are birthmarks on palms a significant thing from a chiromantic perspective? Uh, not really. Okay. Um, a lot of people think of like distortions of hand. Um, injuries sometimes mean a, a section of the hand, a finger maybe is missing. Is that significant? Well, I say it's, it's like the hand is a mirror and you can have a great big crack down the mirror. So as you look at it, it seems like there's a sort of a crack down part of your face or part of your body. But that doesn't necessarily mean that your body is also cracked. Um, so in that way, um, I don't think birthmarks are particularly significant. But um, the lines, even tiny little lines, can be very significant. Thank you. Okay, so the next line to look at is the Mars line. Now, this one is not always present, but it's if it is present, it should be on the Mars mount. Um, I don't know whether you can see that in this light here, but if you've got the curve of the vitality line here, then the Mars lines are located on the Mars mount there. Traditionally, it's a very short line, um, but in our more modern civilized existence, you get like a parallel vitality line, um, which is, in a sense, it's good. It gives us an augmented sense of physical strength that supports our bodies. So Mars is God of War, and traditionally its presence is a sign of someone who's quite pugnacious, who's very easily sparked off and roused and lose their temper. But that's not necessarily how you interpret it today. Um, so you think of it as supporting and giving extra strength to the lifeline. Um, but what is more common, and I'll, I'll illustrate it a bit later on in my talk, is that Martian energy creates internal stress for us. And we'll see examples of that when we look at the handprint. The Jupiter line or heart line, that starts on the little finger side of the hand and comes across to the Jupiter mount here. Um, it represents the opening of the heart to receive the inspiration from the spirit world. So there's the intellectual spirit world. And then since the more the heart opens up, the more a person can draw upon that inner knowledge. It's a line that's connected to emotional expression, hence the name heart line. The Saturn line starts at the base of the hand uh, at this point here and goes up to the Saturn mount at the base of the middle finger. Um, again, it's not always present. Um, it's to do with a person's sense of discipline required to make their ideas manifest into the world. And where it's strongly formed, then it confers 
a strong ability to make ideas manifest. And obviously part of that is what is your career, what's your purpose, what's your general direction in life. Hence the palmistic line, a name of fate or career line. Moving on, we find the sun line. That should start here and go up to the ring finger. Seldom fully present and probably 90% of hands is only partially present. It's quite rare to see a wholly fully formed sunlight. Where it is present, then a person strongly connects to their inner light, to their inner creativity and is able to articulate that. Um, whatever they do, they will be particularly gifted at, and whatever they focus upon, they will give a, a sort of a resonance about it that makes it stand out, shine out from other similar uh, endeavours. And with that extra shining, so it attracts attention. And that's where we get the idea of the fame line. Not everyone who has the line is famous, but often people who do have the line do stand out. But, you know, in these, this day and age, people could be famous for most ridiculous things. I mean, you know, you've got a program Gogglebox and you've just got groups of families watching things on TV and they've become world celebrities sitting on the sofa. Um, whereas a few centuries ago, you became famous by circumnavigating the globe and uh, winning battles or making amazing discoveries, um, that sort of thing. So that's what the sun line will be connected with. Finally, just to complete the sort of seven planets, moon, the lunar line, a very rare hand, uh, rarely found on the hand. I've only ever seen two in the course of 40 years of reading palms. And it's connected with a strong psychic ability. Uh, generally gives people a clairvoyance. But what is more commonly present is these little striations. Uh, and that sort of shows imagination being activated. So perhaps to a lesser degree, people are able to draw from their imagination and articulate it in a sort of meaningful way. Uh, perhaps like writers will often have a headline that delves into the lunar mound so they can access it in that way. But for someone to have a fully formed line uh, forming this sort of crescent shape, then they often are totally connected to the spirit world all the time. They can't switch it off. And the clairvoyance I have met, that is their biggest bugbear, is they often end up totally neurotic wrecks. And one in particular, I remember, was a complete chain smoker. She just couldn't stop. And people were coming to her all the time. And it was absolute pandemonium going on um, in her living room. Um, but I don't want to get too distracted about that. So linking a planet to the line gives you a general allocation of what area of consciousness that line relates to. Now we can start exploring it. So one of the first things we do is the width of a line. So if you imagine the analogy of a line being like a river, then the width of a line or rather the width of a river determines how that river flows. If you've got a very narrow gully, then the water shoots through that gully. If you've got a very wide river, then the river slows down and becomes quite static, stagnant even, languorous. If we look at the widths here, 
they're all connected with the different elements. Earth is very thick. It's maybe about uh, two or three millimeters wide. And that's at one end of the spectrum. Whereas the water width is exceedingly slender, a bit like a glass cut or even a paper cut in the skin. Air is slightly wider than the water one, and then fire is wider again from air, but not as wide as earth. So just to illustrate that, if you use the symbolism of the elements to describe the energy flowing in a line, if we take the headline reflecting our person, a person's mental nature, if you've got someone with a big, thick earth mercury line, then it would describe that they think very slowly, very thoroughly. The minds are uncluttered with excessive worry, abstraction or whatever. They'll see things very much at face value. They'll take the spade as a spade to them. There's no other nonsense about what a spade can represent. Um, that is how they think. It's totally matter of a fact. With fire, then there's linking of ideas with actions and what they've done, what they're going to do, plans, strategies, organizing time and energy. Um, it gives people a sort of argumentative, critical quality. Um, so challenge other people who think differently perhaps opposing how you think. With air, there's more expansion, more reflection. So ideas can be entertained, but not necessarily focused upon. And then broader um, space exists, broader perspective, whereby other ideas, other viewpoints can be taken on board so there's more rapport, more communication. So the air width line will be more for a philosopher or the academic who will study lots of books and write theses, uh, be very eloquent about communicating in their writing or so forth. The water width would describe someone with much more delicate mind who thinks very visually, perhaps not so good with words, but very, very good with visual imagery. Um, so they will often communicate far more poetically, far more to do with symbolism. I mean, you find, for example, loads of people with air quality mercury lines um, are drawn to studying symbolism in all its forms and, and indeed studying handwriting. So you can look at lines in enormous detail and through the course of the length, the width may vary. And that may mean that through the course of a person's life, there's different intensity placed on that realm. Then there's all the markings. Now I'm not going to go into all these, but a good line on the hand should be clear and well formed. It should be free from any, any of these markings that you see listed here. Um, it should be free from any sudden or extreme deviations and simply flow across the hand. And with that, there is a corresponding clarity to their consciousness in whatever area it is. So the markings then, they sort of punctuate the flow and every type of marking has its own story as how that energy is broken up and disrupted. I'm just going to illustrate it with one example, the island at the top. So if you imagine um, flowing down a river, and then the river hits an obstacle, then 
the waters are split and it flows around to the other side when the water can rejoin again. So if we connect the island to being, say, in, in the headline, the mercury line, then it represents a mental obstacle. And because of that obstruction, one part represents an ideal of what you want. And then the other part actually embodies the reality of what you're doing. And the very fact that there is this island shows what you're experiencing doesn't match up to what you would like. Hence, it encapsulates this time of conflict. So maybe you go on to university, you um, choose a particular topic you want to get a degree in. When you get studying it, you find it's not what you thought it was and what you're kind of being taught is not what you had in mind um, when you sort of initially subscribed to the course. And so you get this sort of cognitive dissonance, this conflict between the two, and ultimately change the course or um, a few years down the line, it will show a resolution whereby the ideals are matched with reality. But seeing that, feature in a hand, you can describe the nature of the conflict. And that in itself may be the trigger for what they come to see you about. I mean, we've spoken earlier, Michael spoke earlier about people need particular focus to issues that they want answers to. Well, when you look at the hand, it's features like an island concording to their current age that brings things into focus. Right, so oh, some stuff there. I'd like to quickly jump to the zodiac. Um, again, if you study the zodiac, you've got the four elements, and for each element, you've got a cardinal sign, a fixed sign, and a mutable one. And that triplicity you can correspond to the three levels of Mercury. So cardinal signs are to do with sort of formulating ideals, goals, aspirations. Fixed signs are to do with sort of ideas becoming concrete, applied, manifest. And yet in the middle, you've got this realm of will. So you might have a bright idea, but unless you infuse emotional energy, get fired up about it, it won't become concrete, it won't become manifest. Contrary to that, if you infuse a lot of energy into your ideas, then it will become manifest, become solid and established. So that describes um, the variations of different signs of the zodiac. And these are then applied to the fingers. So the index finger is water, the middle finger is earth, the ring finger is fire, and the little finger is air, and then the thumb is ether, the fifth element. So taking the signs of the zodiac in accordance with that grid I've just shown you, then you can allocate sort of cancer, um, Pisces and Scorpio to the water finger. So the cardinal sign, the mutable sign, and the fixed sign. And if you follow through the rest of the chart, you'll see how all those fit in. So we use the signs of the zodiac for understanding different areas of knowledge that a person can draw upon. But as I've said, I'm not going to go into that today. That's more specialist topic, um, which we'll be covering in course that I'd like to teach. I just want to really focus on this about change. Um, I said earlier that change can be shown in the hand within six weeks. Now, many moons ago, I was involved with doing yoga in, in Denmark 
and the teacher there, Swami Narayan Ananda, um, specifically taught yoga to kind of hippies. Basically, he saw people were foolishly getting involved with drugs and opening themselves up spiritually. And he said, no, don't do that. You'll damage yourself. And what you need to do is to formally train to do yoga. And so he attracted a whole contingent of people who kind of blew their minds of acid and so forth. And this guy was one of them. Now, prior to becoming a monk, he was basically a junkie. He was born into a broken home, ran away in his early teens, became involved with drugs, and basically spent most of his time in search of a fix, stealing things, selling them, get some money to just cover his habit. He wound up at this ashram in Denmark for the reasons I've described and became amazingly inspired um, to the discipline of yoga. And I've got the sort of the order of the day there. I can leave you to, to read that. But I would just like now to turn to various features in the palm. Um, here we've got a simian line. This is an unusual feature, but not uncommon. You get one straight line that cuts across the hand that forms the place of the heart line, which normally flows from here up to there, and the headline that comes down to here. So that formation shows a fusion between head and heart. And if you imagine what that would mean, that anything that you think about, you become very emotionally involved with. So just reading something that's fictional, and if it's anything is disturbing about it, you will be precipitated into kind of emotional chaos. And similarly, anything that sort of excites your feelings, however insignificant, will trigger a cascade of ideas. So a lot of people with this feature have great difficulty uh, discriminating between head and heart and get embroiled in confusion between the two. So he's got that feature. Now, I described to you how his teenage years I was totally insecure. The lifeline, the vitality line, reflects also our degree of foundation and stability in our lives. And obviously the early part of the line is to do with our familial influence. And then gradually as we go out into the world, um, we come develop a degree of autonomy. This island is a massive island spanning from about 13 to 21 when he wound up in this, this ashram. So here is this huge chunk of insecurity that he went through while he was a junkie. Many people who took acid blew their minds, quite literally had a sort of mind expanding experience. And I've often seen on people's hands of people who've taken LSD that their headline becomes very, very long. And on one hand in particular, it came right round even onto the back of the hand. That was just amazing. Here you can see a very long one. Um, perhaps I didn't think at the time, saw at the time how far around the hand it went, but it's got right down to the bottom. That is way too long for our normal everyday communication and sharing of ideas. Again, when people open themselves up with acid, 
they can become psychically scrambled. They just can't handle um, different vibes from all sorts of directions, from, from people, from books, or particular places. Um, and that general scrambling is shown by the lack of clarity here. I was mentioning earlier about the Mars line, how it should be clear and well formed. Um, where's my cursor gone? Here we go. They should be nice, clean cut lines there. But in place of that, you've got myriads of little lines carving across the Venus mount and punctuating the vitality line. So that is very descriptive of stress building up inside the person and literally shaking and undermining the foundations of their whole being. So there'll be a lot of kind of neurological uh, stress issues um, associated with that. So what else have we got here? I think I've covered everything. Oh yes, if you look at the general way the hand has gone down onto the paper, um, there's a tautness about that hand. Perhaps you can't readily see that, but when you contrast it with the next hand print, um, it will become more apparent. So basically this guy um, had done yoga, two hours of yoga a day, hours half the yoga, probably an hour spent in the company of Swamiji. And the rest of the time, he did hard manual work on the farm that was in support of the ashram. Six years later, here is his handprint again. And you can see immediately the more relaxed position of the fingers. So that's, that's a much calmer person. If you look at the Venus mount, it's virtually being wiped clean here. So a huge amount of stress has gone. So all that yoga and pranayama, relaxation has sort of percolated through his psyche and he's now physically far more grounded, far more anchored. You can look at this headline, uh, which I said was excessively long, and you can see it's shortened right down. And I've actually got another handprint, which I haven't kind of got in print in book form. But this simian line is actually broken up into a separate headline and a separate part line. Um, but this bit shows that's all well on the way there. This area here, which I said was connected with psychic scrambling, you can see all that's cleared away. And this line here is like the upper bit of the heart line forming. So all in all, that's quite a dramatic improvement. Um, The top phalanges are much, much clearer. So I've, I've put the two together there now. They can spend a few moments and I spot the difference. Um, it's the fun bit of, of hand reading. Now this, this actually reveals a kind of very important um, element to hand reading. And that when you observe all the markings and all the features, you can sort of see negative patterns then if you can see that marking, then it's already present in that person's consciousness in some way. But if you can then understand how that bar, how that island, how that stress line is become manifest through reading other parts of the hand, then it gives you tools to impart to that person advice that they can follow that when they put it into action in time will compensate for that feature. And I mean, when I've got my other hat on, I'm a medical herbalist. And um, 
I have done hand readings um, allied to some of my patients who I felt needed more psychological guidance as to why they get involved with health issues. And over a sort of few months, uh, over a year, you can take a succession of handprints, uh, I would say about six months, a year apart. And in that time, you can spot subtler changes, not as dramatic. This is quite rare. This, this guy made major, major undertaking of change in his life and it bore dramatic fruit. But where I've sort of helped people overcome nervous issues, then you subtly get their stress being displayed on the palm. You can see the headline become a more manageable length and so on. So these are, I think, very valuable things you can do with the hand reading. You can give advice, send them on their way. If they put, put it into action, when they come back, then they will have learned the lessons in overcoming various conflicts and difficulties and become freer, they will have grown as, as people and they'll become more knowledge, knowledgeable as people and in turn are then be able to recognize similar patterns in other people and in turn help them through various problems and difficulties. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of palmistry books tend to have a very fatalistic um, impression about them. And I think this is wrong. Um, the lines on the hand are dynamic, they're fluid. So negative features should be framed in such a way that describes what they're currently going through and then move on to what they can do about it and what the nature of the experience is potentially going to teach them. Um, and then once they've overcome it, then um, the lines will realign on the palm. So coming back to this wonderful image, um, I know many of you are coming to this course who are astrologers, perhaps who studied with Michael. Um, this illustration deserves a second look. There's a big symbol here, the seeker Pisces, this ovoid shape here. The seeker Pisces means the fish bladder. And it's a symbol of the universal mother. And so here we've got mankind um, being born out of the universe. So the labia, the lips of the seeker, you can see the 12 signs of the constellations of the zodiac. And then within it, you see two bodies. This is unusual for zodiacal um, descriptions. The one that's facing us, I believe, is a more feminine body. And then there's one the other way around, who's back to us, and the physiognomy is much more masculine. And that is significant, I believe, because the feminine body is our astral body, the one of the vital force that connects with the planets and so forth, whereas the more masculine body is our physical body. And so the heavens are connected to us through the sort of astral body and then through to the physical body. So this image basically means mankind is born, made in the image of the heavens. So it's all about this as above, so below, this wonderful hermetic maxim. So it's fascinating comparing a natal chart, a birth chart, to the patterns and formations of the palm. 
So for astrologers, you would look at a planet within a particular sign and then think about how that planetary energy is expressed within the element of that sign. So if you've got Venus in detriment, in Aries, Aries first sign of the zodiac is normally ruled by Mars. And so when Venus is placed there, it's antagonized by Mars. So part of the loving, nurturing quality of Venus is compromised by the, the burning intensity of Mars. And if that's compounded by sort of Mars being square Venus in Aries, then the energy of Venus will be particularly compromised. So with that configuration, when you look in the hand, when you look at the Venus line, you'd expect to find a lot of Martian uh, distortion marring the clear flow of the Venus line, not unlike what I was articulating and explaining in the hand of the monk. So I'm not going to go further into that. Um, you kind of need to know about astrology and you need to know about chiromancy before you can fully indulge in how the two disciplines overlap. And even so, there's no clear cut way. You can't always say that the planet of the, of the chart ruler is necessarily strong in the hand. It may be strong, in which case if Venus was a chart ruler, then the Venus mount might be strong and you get pronounced um, vitality line curving around it. Um, but you may find Venus a chart ruler and you could get the inverse that in the hand, Venus is very poorly represented. And so you've got this latent Venusian energy that through the course of their life, they need to kind of express love and to kind of gain a, a security and stability through unfolding their love and abilities. So that's, that's in a nutshell, it's how you compare the two, but that's much more advanced to do that. So I, I believe the study of astrology is a fascinating adjunct to hand reading. Um, that's because I primarily am a hand reader before I became an astrologer. Um, but if you're an astrologer already, you'll find that the study of chiromancy is fascinating for understanding how the chart manifests. So a natal chart is often described as a map of the soul. Well, the hand is the terrain of how the soul is kind of incarnated into a body. And the two don't necessarily marry up, but it is fascinating exploring how the two are interconnected. So, in winding up my course, so my lecture here, I hope I've given you an insight into the immense cultural potential of reading hands. And if you are, then Michael has given me the opportunity for doing a chiromancy course here at Heraculos. And as mentioned earlier, we intend kicking off with that. If you follow this link, um, it will take you to the syllabus and you see the course structure, the various topics that we go into. Uh, so at that point, I throw things open for questions. All right, Dylan, thank you so much. And I'm, I'm putting the information down below in the, uh, in the chat box for those of you who want to go and check it out. Um, you could find Dylan's course over at the website. So we have three questions uh, that are coming from Nancy and one question coming from Patri. And one of the questions that Nancy asks were, are these lines easier to see on print than on the actual hand? They're much easier to see in, in the print. 
Okay. Um, even in this di digital age, people have put their hand on scanners and things and sent me a sort of photocopy. I, I hate that because you get a lot of distortion. You know, it's like the school kids rubbing their noses up against the form room window, you know, when they're being naughty. <laughs> uh, there's a sort of hideousness that creeps in that conceals too much information. Mm -hmm. Now, the old analog technology of getting ink onto the hand, taking a good handprint, um, it's a acquired skill, but once you get it on, on pat, then you get really good contrast that you can sort of work with. So I much prefer working with a handprint. When you look at the live hand, I mean, some people do like to just work with a live hand. I think they're tuning in more readily to a person's energy when they're doing it. It's very difficult, you know, a sudden change in the angle of the light and various markings and features will disappear or come into view. So you see something, you explain what it's all about, and you come back to it and think, oh gosh, where was it? <laughs> and you can spend a few seconds trying to make sense of um, the hand again. Um, so that's why I prefer the print. You can put your baro on, on where you're at. Um, you can draw on it um, and so forth. Awesome, Dylan. Well, there is another question. And before we go there, for those of you who want to purchase Dylan's book, The Hand Reveals, the new version, it's on Amazon.com. And I put the link down below in the in the. I keep on saying the comments section in the description, in the, what is this, in the chat box. And so please go and purchase Dylan's book on Amazon. I have this version, Dylan, I don't know if I showed you this, and that this is the version I have, The Hand Revealed uh, by Dylan Warren Davis. And in this book, you have a forward by Olivia Barkley. Yes, uh, Olivia was a very supportive friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the new edition, uh, Sharon Knight, is given a forward and Sharon studied horary with Olivia. Mm -hmm. and I thought that was a nice poetic uh, continuity between the first and the fourth edition of mm -hmm. uh, The Hand of Reels. Yeah, Sharon is a really wonderful friend of mine and, um, and she's a brilliant astrologer. So um, I, I, I'm, I'm happy that she did your forward. And I purchased a copy as well. So I'm going to have this copy that I have all of my all noted and I'm sure that I'm going to love the new copy as well and please people go and grab yourselves a copy of Dylan Warren Davis's book The Hand Reveals as well. Now Dylan there's been a lot of talk and people have been texting me back and forth and the Oraculites are very fired up about about your chiromancy program and so I've I've planted the seed that maybe we'll have to really consider pushing the program up earlier in the spring. Is that something you'd be open to doing to them? I can kick off virtually any time. So if you wanted to do start in January or February or something, then I'm, I'm up for that. Awesome, awesome. So people, if, if you want to uh, be taking the course earlier, please do let us know. Um, you could shoot us an email via the website. You could shoot me an email personally. So Dylan, the next question that we have is also another question from Nancy, uh, which is more of a technical question. She's asking if the sun line is more prominent on the top or bottom of the hand, does that mean fame or career discipline early in life or later in life? Um, when they get in the upper part, that generally refers to the latter end of their line. Okay. So uh, beyond 45, um, I mean, it's very rare to see the fully formed one, but by the sort of, after the midlife crisis, generally people start to sort of finally make sense of their life and maybe change direction and really find out what they really been meaning to do all their life, uh, but they got hijacked by just probably earning money or hijacked by relationships and so forth. Um, so that's that's when it generally kicks in. Awesome. Uh, other question: Is the Sibian line an empathic line? Empathic. 
Um, I believe it can be. Um, I've described it in a very negative way, um, but I have done some readings for people which have shown me how it can be used very, very wonderfully. And one woman in particular impressed me in that she um, worked with deaf and dumb children. And she used her feeling uh, to evoke her ideas so she could then understand what it was or what it is that these children were trying to articulate. So she would then give the children various signs in the sign language that unlocked them from their silent inner world. So um, I think the empathetic quality that it can give is brilliant. Um, I've also recently become aware, I hadn't noticed it before, but quite a few well-known actors who are outstanding um, have got simian lines. And uh, in particular, Benedict Cumberbatch, um, uh, taxi driver, uh, Robert De Niro, um, the guy, the Welsh guy who, um, Anthony Burgess, they've all got similar lines. And I think if you think about the actor will learn their dialogue and script, and then as they work on it in their mind's eye, they can then infuse the right amount of emotional energy into the words that they articulate. So I think they bring a sort of larger than life uh, richness to the dialogue of the film or play that they're performing. So yes, I think that's another way. Can I just say someone's put up, I've got a Sydney line, I'm not a murderer. Um, yeah, in palmistry books, it's pretty bad. Uh, if you've got that sign, you're a murderer. But that is, is I think, um, overly fatalistic. Um, it means you can easily be wound up. Um, and for that reason, if someone winds you up too much, you could fly off the handle and might lead to further injury. But in itself, it won't necessarily make you a, a murderer. And as I just said, if you understand the energies of how head and heart are fused together, then it can lead to other forms of richness and understanding, which is far removed from ending up in jail. The last question comes from Patri, who's asking, how would you measure the age on the lifeline? Very simply is the principal lines, the lifeline, the headline, the heart line. You can take the full span as being roughly three school years and 10, this sort of biblical age. Well, obviously not everyone reaches 70. Many people go well past that point. But if you imagine that sort of uh, length as being 70 years, then just put your finger in the middle, that'd be 35. And then having got that 35 mark, it's relatively easy to calibrate in your mind's eye five and 10 year uh, intervals. So you might find an island and you would sort of estimate that um, that started at 20 and went on to 25. And the person might say, well, what you're describing actually started at 18, in which case you can sort of calibrate things with greater accuracy. So it starts at 18 and ends at 23. So once you've got definite time um, encapsulated with various markings and features, it enables you to tune in more readily um, into the rest of the line. But that's something that we, we deal with at length, uh, actually, in the course and the training that we'll be doing. Awesome. Awesome. Dylan, once again, thank you so much for sharing with us today. And I, I learned a whole lot and I'm really happy to have had you here. And we are super excited 
to have your chorus sooner than we plan to have it because everyone here is really excited about it as well. So um, um, thank you so much. Good news. <laughs> well, thanks everyone for listening. All right. Thank you so much. Again. <laughs> All right. So everyone, thank you once again for joining uh, two thirds of our programming for today. And I definitely learned a lot from Dylan's presentation and from the text messages and the private messages. I know that everyone has as well. So like I said, we're going to have a conversation amongst ourselves as the Oraculos team to to really uh, push Dylan's course up because uh, we won't want for the momentum to stop that he's established today. So please look out for more information about that from us at Oraculos.